Uh, no. Hello? Yeah, I can. Just testing the mic. If I could have my panelists up here. Do you want me to wait? Shall I wait? Okay. Just waiting for people to join online. Um, we have a couple of hundred people who are tuning in. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, well, welcome all, everyone, to the uh, re uh, annual uh, report of the in Internet Watch Foundation. Uh, my name's Andrew Pulifat. I'm the chair of the organization. It's actually my last year as chair, and it's been, I think, probably the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life, which uh, I think is a testimony to the, both the importance and the strength of the organization. A couple of things first. I have to announce a couple of deaths of long-term supporters of ours. Neil Furbrother from SafetyNet, who, uh, who unfortunately died quite recently, and Andrew Cormack, who was a previously chair of our funding council, which is our industry liaison body. Um, very sad to record their deaths. I also want to convey apologies from Susie Hargreaves, our chief executive, who would normally be in attender here. Um, Susie is awaiting treatment for cancer, and given the travails of the NHS, She's having to wait for a cancellation, last minute cancellation, and so she doesn't want to risk getting COVID and actually losing that slot, so she sends her apologies. But she'll be joining us here on, online. So Emma will be presenting the report shortly, and I think a couple of things really stood out for me, and, I, and I, one of the ambivalences, really, about being the chair of the IWF at an event like this is normally with a charity, it's a chance to sort of humble brag about how the charity's doing, how great we are, what a successful year we've had, et cetera. And we've had a very successful year. You know, we found more child abuse material than ever before. But in a way, it's a very ambivalent thing to report. I'd much rather be standing here and saying, I'm afraid we haven't done very much this year. We haven't found very much, because that would signify that the problem is clearly diminishing, and it's not. And with the support of the Home Office, the National Crime Agency, and our members, we've been able to recruit more analysts. With the NCA, we've given, been given access to the NCA's database of illegal images, which means the service we can provide our members has expanded considerably. We now have about 1.7 million images of children being sexually abused, which are available to our members to block or remove. So it's a tremendous resource we have. We have a very, very high quality database, probably the highest quality data set in the world of, of images. So we have a lot to be proud of, but there's some very sobering things to reflect on, particularly the growth in the number of the abuse of children under two and under five, and the severity of the abuse of those children, uh, where an increasing number of those children are being subjected to what we call category A abuse, which is rape and sadism of various kinds. So it's a very worrying trend, and I think another trend that we're picking up now is whereas in the past it was people with a sexual interest in children exchanging images, we're now seeing the entry of organized crime. And organized crime, I think, is likely to focus on the most severe abuse of the youngest children because that will be the most lucrative market for them. So that's also a very worrying trend that we're seeing. So the importance of the dealing with this problem, I think, is, is, is manifest than before. On the positive side, I think we have the wholehearted commitment of the majority of the industry, the tech industry behind us. The tech industry does not want this material on their, web, on, their, on their platforms and are determined to work with us to remove that. We also know there's pretty much, I mean, I'm working with the UN on global internet regulation and the only area where there's a consensus about content that should be removed is child sex abuse. There's, there's no agreement on almost anything else. Child sex abuse, pretty much every jurisdiction, every policymaker everywhere in the world supports that. And clearly we have a, it's, a, it's a not a partisan issue. This is not party political. Everybody in any policy position wants this problem dealt with. So we've got a lot of resources that, to deploy to deal with this problem. And I think one of the things we need to think about as, as a group and as an IWF and our friends and partners is how we can mobilize those resources to deal with these things. What's the role that we all can play? Not just the companies, but parents, members of society, members of parliament, policymakers, and so on. There's a role for all of us. 
We're going to discuss that uh, with the panel shortly, but I'm just going to hand over now briefly to Theo from TikTok to say a few words, and then Emma will present the report, and then we'll have a panel discussion. We're not going to take, because of the time constraints, uh, questions in the open session, but there is a, a, an informal session afterwards, so hopefully you can talk and interact with members of the panel there with any issues you want to raise. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I just want to say um, uh, welcome to the IDWF and to all of you to TikTok. Uh, it's a great privilege for us to host you all here today. Uh, TikTok's relationship with the IWF goes back uh, three, four years, which may not seem like a long time to you, but in TikTok years is a lifetime. And uh, they're an absolutely critical partner for us. The report published today is harrowing, but also really important for our industry understanding these trends and the data, um, the rise in category A offenses, the rise in the, the, air, the, the more youthful areas where we're seeing those predators, the rise in monetization of that content, and in particular, I think, the growth of self-generated content and how that's uh, initiated. Um, I think those are all key uh, trends and data that uh, we as an industry um, will find very valuable working with the IWF to counter and prevent. Um, so this report is really important. We're delighted to host um, IWF today. And um, uh, I just want to pay tribute to the work that the IWF do and to the work that their staff does. I know that everyone um, in the IWF and in uh, our industry that works on these type of issues, this is the hardest area for anyone working in our industry to work on. It's the most important job and it's hugely appreciated uh, by all of us, both those as people working in this industry and also as parents. So I just want to say thank you. Thanks, Theo. Emma, can I pass over to you to present the highlights from the report, please? Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So I'm absolutely delighted today to bring you this report. Obviously, I say that um, despite the fact that we're talking about child sexual abuse imagery. Um, you can find the report at the URL, annualreport22.iwf.org.uk, and it's a full website this year. But you can also download it as a PDF, and all of the graphs are downloadable. We do that because we want our data and trends to be used by you and be useful for your work as well. And if, as you're looking through, given the fact that it's my team ultimately that pulls all of this together, and in two weeks we have our meeting to discuss what the next one will be like, if when you're looking at this at any time you think, oh gosh, I wish, I wish they would just present this data like that, or could they cut the data slightly differently, that would really help with my work, please, please get in touch because this is completely within our gift to do. So my name is Emma Hardy. I'm the Communications Director at the Internet Watch Foundation and a UK Safer Internet Centre Director. And I'm going to say a little bit about who we are, what we do, but I think probably most of you know all of this already, so I'm not going to linger on it. We're a not-for-profit child protection organisation. And we've been around for 26 years now, and people report into us if they suspect they find images or videos of child sexual abuse. And they do this through our website at iwf.org.uk, but they can also do this from one of 50 countries around the world covering 2.6 billion people. Ultimately, our core role is to identify images and videos of child sexual abuse, and then we work with whoever we need to work with around the world to ensure that that imagery is removed. Additionally, off the back of that imagery, we collate a huge amount of data and intelligence, and we then turn that into tools and data sets and services, which we make available to internet companies to keep their services safer. And I'm really pleased to say that this year, we have had more companies than ever before work with us, more than 180 global companies trust us to help them keep their 4 billion plus worldwide customers and user accounts protected from online child sexual abuse material. And there they are. And once upon a time, I would have been saying 180 technology companies, but that's just not the case anymore. We've had companies in the financial sector and even in the hotel industry join us this year to work with us. 
The independent inquiry into child sexual abuse said of the IWF that the IWF sits at the heart of the national response to combating the proliferation of indecent images of children and that it's an organisation that deserves to be publicly acknowledged as being a vital part of how and why comparatively little child sexual abuse material is hosted in the UK. And we're now part of the ICSA Changemakers group, and this is a group that's been formed following the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. We're a core funding partner, and there are over 60 organisations working at this group at the moment. And the aim is to inspire a national mission to prevent child sexual abuse and provide much improved support to victims and survivors. Ultimately, the group exists to ensure that the recommendations of the ICSA report are implemented. And there are three key recommendations. The cabinet level minister for children is appointed that child protection measures are retained in the online safety bill and victims and survivors of child sexual abuse receive specialist support under the victims and prisoners bill. The scale of the issue is massive, such is the scale that every one and a half minutes our analysts who are sat in Cambridge, they assess a web page and every two minutes that web page shows a child being sexually abused. We have a number of four words in our annual report and I've just picked out sections of a couple of them here. The first is from the Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology who said of the Internet Watch Foundation that we are a highly dedicated team. We remain at the forefront of rapid detection and removal of child sexual abuse through the use of cutting edge technology. And Ilva Johansson, the European Commissioner for Home Affairs, said the Internet Watch Foundation plays a key role in finding, reporting and removing online records of child sexual abuse. So let's get into the data. Last year, we assessed, our human analysts assessed 375,230 suspected reports of child sexual abuse material. And then this chart specifically shows where the sources of those, um, that, those reports were. So 64%, over 240,000 of those were found through our proactive searching. And we're one of only a couple of hotlines in the world that have the legal ability to be able to proactively search for child sexual abuse material. The public submitted to us 126,000 reports. Nearly 7,000 reports came from the police and almost 1,000 came from our members. And of those, 255,588 were confirmed to contain images and videos that showed child sexual abuse. And if you think about it, each one of those reports could have one, two, ten, hundreds or thousands of images attached. So in reality, we're talking millions of individual images and videos. And of those reports, nearly 200,000 contained what's termed self-generated child sexual abuse, which is not a term that I like, as many of you know, not a term that we like as the Internet Watch Foundation, because it suggests that there's an element of blame on the victim. However, we are working on new technology. So for the purposes of this report, we have used the term self-generated. But it's where children have been groomed, coerced, or exploited online. Our hash list, which Andrew touched on, it's thanks to the unique and trusted relationship that we have with the Home Office, and in particular the Child Abuse Image Database, that we've been assessing and hashing child sexual abuse images which have been seized by police. And then together with our own proactive searching online, we've created more than 1.7 million unique hashes of child sexual abuse images. And with each hash, we enrich that with metadata, which is a set of tags, essentially, that provides detailed information about what's happening in each of those images. Each image hash is then made available to UK law enforcement and our members with the idea that it can stop the upload, the sharing and distribution of those images across those services and platforms. And what's more, this unique, enriched data set can also be used to train safety tech software of the future, and we add to this number daily, so I dare say that that is already out of date. 
And then InHope, we are incredibly proud to be a founding member of InHope, which is the global hotline for combating, global network of hotlines for combating online child sexual abuse. And we've been even more proud of the contribution that we've been able to make this year. In 2022, and considering there's 50 hotlines in this network, IWF has contributed 63% of all illegal content items to their database. So let's take a little bit more of a look into the data. And you can see here the yellow line tracks the percentage, the proportion of reports that we have seen that contain imagery of girls. And the green line there tracks the proportion of reports that contain boys. If we look back into 2012, for example, you can see that 75% contained girls. In 2022, that number is now 96%. And then for boys, 10% in 2012 of all the reports that we saw contained boys. And then in 2022, that's 2%. But the proportions only tell half the story. So, for example, in 2012, where it's saying 10%, that's actually just under 1,000 reports. In 2022, which is only 2%, if I can put it like that, that's actually 6,253 reports. So the numbers have grown incredibly over that time, even if the proportions suggest that the proportion-wise, the content of boys is getting less. And then if we take a deeper look into the age breakdown of reports, for the past few years, we've seen how children aged 11 to 13 are most often seen in the imagery that we're seeing in our hotline, and that's the orange bar there. The blue bar, which is the bar I'd like you to pay attention to as well, 7 to 10-year-olds, take a look at how, how big that bar is, and then you can really see year on year. So we're tracking 11 to 13-year-olds in 2020, 2021 and 2022, where it drops a little bit at 2022. These are the 7 to 10 year olds in 2020, 2021, and then 2022. 7 to 10 year olds are the fastest growing age group that we are currently seeing online. And then if we take a look into the severity of the abuse that we're seeing, so we've got category A. In the UK, it's category A, B, and C. And category A, if you're able to see it at the bottom of the screen or when you're, you're watching on the stream at home, there are images and videos pen of penetrative sexual activity, images involving sexual activity with an animal or sadism. So we're now looking at 2020, 2021, and 2022 category A content. Proportion-wise, in 2020, it was 17%. Last year, it was 20%. However, the numbers tell a different story. In 2020, there were 25,000 such reports. Last year, it was over 50,000. So that content has doubled, even though the proportion-wise is just three percentage points different. This is category B content. In 2020, you can see it's 16%. It has gone up. 10 percentage points last year to 26%, but the numbers, again, tell a different story still. 23,800 in 2020 compared to last year, 65,000, which means that the proportion of category C content has gradually decreased. And then the location of content. So whenever we find child sexual abuse images or videos, we need to perform a trace on that content. And ultimately, that's where we need to find out on which server, in which country, is that content hosted. Because once we know that, that then dictates the actions that we take in the hotline in order to get that content removed and which partners we need to work with. Since 2016, we have seen that Europe has been the biggest hoster of child sexual abuse material according to what we are seeing online at 66%, followed by Asia at 18% and North America at 16%. And then the picture in the UK, we've been incredibly proud of the fact that since 2003, the UK hosting space has been quite intolerant to this material and therefore it stood at less than 1%. And in fact, last year, it's less than a quarter of a percent of all child sexual abuse URLs were hosted in the UK. It's worth noting, though, that all 16 companies whose services in the UK were abused to host child sexual abuse material last year were not members of IWF, 
and yet we provided them a service because we do not want this material in UK hosting space. So for every one of those instances, regardless of whether they want to work with us or not, we notified them that the material was there, that it needed taking down to support the swift removal of that with the fastest takedown time being three minutes. And then looking at the content of boys, Last year, we saw a 138% increase in child sexual abuse imagery featuring boys. In numbers terms, that was over 6,000 reports. What we have noticed, though, as well, is that a higher proportion of the imagery showing content of boys is category A material, which is generally penetrative sexual activity when compared to girls. Report remove. So we are incredibly proud to have worked with NSPCC to develop a tool called report remove, which supports the young person to make reports, ultimately through to us, of sexual images or videos of themselves. And unlike um, you being an adult, if you were to find potentially child sexual abuse material on the internet, you would go to our website, you would make a report, and you would send us that URL, that web address. Young people don't have to wait until their material is uploaded online. If they've got it on their phone, then they can make a report to us, they can send us the image or the video, and we will create a hash of that image and video if it fails UK law. And with that hash, we can then, therefore, through our partners, prevent that from being uploaded to the internet. This service was launched in 2021, June 2021, which means we have a whole year's worth of data now. And whilst the numbers of, of reports coming through Report Remove are still small, it's incredibly valuable data because ultimately this is telling us what young people are reporting to us. So the bars that you can see there, those yellow bars, that's the material. They're the number of reports that we've received from girls in those age brackets. The green bars, numbers from boys in those age brackets, but overwhelmingly... Boys aged 16 to 17 years old are using the service more than any other age group. Self-generated child sexual abuse, something that I'm sure lots of people in this room have had multiple discussions about. This is created when a child is typically, we see them in their bedroom or a domestic setting at home, very often alone, or they might have a sibling or a friend with them, and somebody on the other side of a webcam is coercing, grooming them into some kind of sexual activity that someone captures, and then it gets uploaded online. Typically, that's what we see in the IWF. That counts for 200,000 reports that we had last year, which means that four in every five reports contain that type of content. Now, this is a particular chart that when I saw it, when we were putting together the data this year, it really struck me as a kind of call to action. Again, you can see the age groups down one side, and the orange bars represent that content we've received where the abuser is physically present with the child. That is the content where it has been created with some kind of self-generated motive behind it. If we, together, in this room, were to really think about what we could do to prevent the creation of that content, we'd be having a huge dent in what we're seeing currently circulating online. Self-generated content and seven to 10-year-olds. 63,000 such reports last, last year we saw, which was a 129% increase on the year before. And it's worth saying that 14% of that imagery was category A, which means there was some kind of penetrative sexual activity happening in those images, or sexual torture, or sexual activity with animals. Since 2019, which is the last full year before we went into lockdown, there was an increase of over a thousand percent, tenfold, in terms of what we saw of the number of web pages showing images and videos of seven to ten year olds who have been groomed, coerced, or exploited online. And then, finally, a little nod to some of the other things you can find out about in our annual report. The first one being something called ICAP sites. This is something that we first started seeing happening in around July last year. 
And it's a pyramid scheme type of methodology where the person spamming, distributing huge numbers of links, the child sexual abuse material online is then rewarded for the number of clicks or people they bring to that material. They will be rewarded in terms of financially rewarded or rewarded in terms of getting them access to more and more child sexual abuse imagery. You can read about that in our annual report. A doubling of cryptocurrency usage. We've seen this over the past few years. This is where people are using cryptocurrencies to pay for child sexual abuse material. This has doubled over recent years and therefore we have established last year our crypto unit. And then finally, a word about sexually coerced extortion, which again is something that's coming up more and more, certainly in the conversations that I and my colleagues are involved with. Particularly, I mean, it's also termed sextortion, particularly we're seeing this happening with boys. There's a nod to this in the annual report. We're starting to see it come through in our data, and I think this is going to be something that's going to come up continuously throughout this year as well, so much so that we are now creating resources right now to go on our website because people are calling us at IWF, parents and boys are calling us because this is happening to them or their children. So that's it for the presentation. There's a huge amount more data in the annual report, so I really would encourage you to go and have a look and use it for your purposes as well. But I just want to leave you with one question. How many children will this year become, for the first time, a victim of online grooming, online sexual abuse, sexually coerced extortion, and what can you do to try and prevent that? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Emma. And I think it's, well, yeah. I think it's worth thinking about that if three quarters of the images we're seeing are children being coerced into producing them themselves, that's happening in the family home overwhelmingly. So there's an enormous role for parents here in actually understanding the technology, understanding what their children are doing, and being able to talk about it, which I think is one of the hardest things. Because I've, I've certainly found people don't want to know the scale and severity of child abuse online. It's one of the conversations I have that I find people just want to walk away from if I start to have it. And so how we have that conversation, how we raise that in the wider public debate, I think is a really critical issue for prevention and actually intercepting and stopping this thing happening. I I'm really pleased to say we've got a really interesting panel here uh, to discuss these issues. We have Sarah Blight from Ofcom, Tom Farrell from SafetyNet, Leo Bertram you've met from TikTok, and Wendy Hart from the NCA. And uh, Sarah, I'd like to start with you from Ofcom. I mean, obviously, the legislation, the online safety bill, much discussed, much interrogated, much criticized by sections of tech is coming on stream at some point. You've seen the data. We know that uh, this material is not hosted in the UK. It's mostly hosted overseas, usually by very small cyber locker and image hosting companies who are not in scope of the legislation. So what, do you think the regulation is gonna seriously impact on the production of the material? Will it impact more on the sharing of material? How do you see, or how does Ofcom see the regulation as actually helping us in the fight against child sex abuse online? Thanks, Andrew. Um, so for us in Ofcom, and I think across the child protection community, we're very much aware that this won't be a silver bullet to fix this problem overnight. It's very much a much longer journey, and this is the first step in that journey to head towards systemic change in terms of how the internet is regulated, how children can live their lives safer online. For us, in terms of taking those first steps, we can't raise the ceiling until we've raised the floor. So there is something there about getting consistency across services, about things that they're doing, about using proactive tech, about considering children's safety, you know, all of their um, design principles, baking that in at an early stage to make sure that's something that they're really changing on a systemic level. And we can't do this in isolation. This is one tool in a much wider approach um, in this country to um, make children's lives safer online. Um, for version one of what we're going to be bringing out in the codes in our draft consultation document, it's very much about trying to raise awareness of the harms, working really closely with colleagues in the National Assessment Centre, in the NCA, and IWF, to establish a really accurate threat picture of those online harms, and that's what we can then hang mitigations on in terms of holding services to account. 
In terms of hosting content specifically and those, um, you know, obviously overseas uh, file sharing services, cyber lockers, etc. So from a UK perspective, we're looking at mitigations around, and working very close with IWF at the moment actually, about things like URL blocking, link sharing, things like that, looking at where we can have an impact on file sharing services. But more importantly, looking at this not in isolation, but considering the regulation plans of other countries, linking up with other regulators as well in an international space to make sure there's a coordinated effort against this content. Thanks very much. Um, Theo, coming to you. The data is pretty alarming. Um, you, you're part of, I think, the world's most successful app in dealing with young people, and that's used by young people. Do you think there's a role for your kind of service in helping with prevention, helping educate children? Could you say a little bit about what your thoughts are and what TikTok's thoughts might be on that? Yeah, I think um, I, I don't think we're the place where uh, you find this content, but I think we have a. Uh, I think we have to be aware that we have a lot of young users on our platform. And so it's not just a question of can we remove uh, content that breaches our rules, but how do we make the platform hostile to predators, particularly if we're talking about self-generated content. And I also don't like that term, but if we're talking about that sort of what is the journey that, that a predator goes on towards grooming someone, how do we make ourselves hostile to that? And I think <coughs> we can do that through product design. So. We make sure that um, you know, there's no direct messaging uh, for younger users. You can't direct message someone unless you follow them back. The platform is private by default. Live streaming, which we know is a more acute risk, uh, not available for, for younger users. So I think you, know, you can design uh, the platform in a way to increase safety for younger users. And I think that concept of age assurance is there in the OSB and in, and in the, and in the and, and in the in the legislation the UK is leading on. I think that's one part of it. I think the other part of it is we have all of these younger users on our platform. How do we help them um, protect themselves? You know, and, and if there are conversations that parents may find difficult to have with their teenagers, can we help um, uh, younger people on our platform have those conversations with their peers, with organizations like yours? Uh, we ran a campaign in um, in the UK uh, called uh, Girls Out Loud with the IWF, which was about using um, prominent TikTokers to uh, help other young teenagers identify when a predator might be tricking them into um, a, that kind of coercive approach and what they could do to, to avert that process. So I think that's kind of where we see our role and, and where we can help. But you know, I think we're always open to understanding what more we can do. Thanks. And, and Tom, uh, you're from SafetyNet, uh, a, a technology company. And I, uh, obviously, technology is going to play a role in dealing with child sex abuse material. And I think, the, obviously, the hot issue coming up down the line very fast is end-to-end -end encryption and how whether end-to-end -end encryption means that a lot of child sex abuse material simply goes dark or whether one can actually insert something in end-to-end -end encryption that prevents child from being abused without violating people's privacy. Now, we know that companies like WhatsApp and Signal have said they'll withdraw from the UK if there's an attempt to interfere with end-to-end -end encryption. Um, my own personal view is it's unacceptable for any technology company to say to people in this country, you have to choose between privacy and protecting children. I think it's their job to develop the technology that protects privacy and protects children, not tell us it can't be done, it can be done, and they should be doing it, and working on it. What's your, you've been looking at this kind of issue and I think trying to develop technology that can protect privacy and still detect child abuse or deal with child abuse. Could you say a bit about that and whether you think there is a feasible solution? Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to congratulate you on a fantastic report and actually it's what we've got going on at the moment, certainly in the last month or so, is this really polarised debate about we're going to pull out of the UK for end, end encryption and what we should, everybody should bear in mind that what we're seeing is in the meantime, we're seeing seven to 10 year olds, newly generated content taking place on end-to-end -end encrypted platforms, platforms that aren't end-to-end -end encrypted. And this is the real world. Whilst everybody has an argument about privacy or online safety, continue, children are continuing to be coerced into abusing themselves, abusing their siblings. Um, so your report sets a really great context for it. Um, 
So just to put a bit of context of what we're doing, we're working in partnership with the IWF to create what we would call a solution that can prevent the creation of this material in, in real time. So genuine technical prevention. Um, what is quite clear with a lot of this content and th the encouraging side of seeing a slide that says so much is now taking place without an offender in the room is it is preventable. And it should be preventable both in terms of educational prevention, and that is of parents, um, children, legislators, but what it really is capable of being preventable with is technology. Technology is allowing it to happen. Technology can also be created to prevent it to ha from happening. So we've created technology that can sit within an end-to-end -end encrypted environment, for example, and can prevent that platform from allowing child abuse-related material onto their platform. What we don't do is we don't judge on how you report that or whether you have to report that. So the position where, as where I see it and where we see it as an organization is, it is now, as of today, preventable. We just have to find a way of um, everybody agreeing that it can be prevented. And my question would probably be, does that have to involve reporting? Because in my understanding of it, the biggest issue for many of the tech companies is the reporting aspect rather than the preventing the material um, appearing and being generated in the first place. So a compromise might be technology that sits on a device that prevents images being uploaded but doesn't report them anywhere. So arguably people's privacy is not being violated because it's not going anywhere. Is that the, the argument, yeah? So that, that would be the argument. Um, for want of a better term, a risk mitigation practice where it's not actually possible for that platform to be used by that used in that way and what we've seen with for example the reduction of hosting in the UK is it means people have to go elsewhere now the more platforms who take the responsible approach and make their platform hostile for this kind of offending the the, the smaller areas where it can occur on the on the internet thanks Wendy uh, NCA you're at the sharp end of all of this and so you must look at that the data that we present and the data that you will see yourselves uh, and feel it's a pretty significant challenge and that one that can't just be dealt with by law enforcement on its own. There's not a, there's not a policing way out of this problem. But uh, what, when you look at that, what do you think are the key priorities for you? And how, how do you see, are you concerned about the, the, as we see it, the detection of organized crime becoming involved in monetizing, which is obviously a new dimension to this. And I just wondered what the take currently, what you can share with us about the take that you're making on this at the moment. Thanks very much. Can I just pick up on the end-to-end -end encryption point? I think it is really important. The prevention, obviously, is critical, and the more we can prevent, the better. But where it does become known and seen, then reporting is incredibly important. And law enforcement in the UK arrests over 800 people and safeguards over 1,000 children a month. And a lot of that comes to us through reporting. So we are critically concerned that we don't lessen the protection that's available to children right now and the law enforcement response to that. So I just want to put that point out there. In terms of the stats, and again, uh, following Tom, I'd like to congratulate you on a, on a really great report. It's, it's a really difficult read, uh, but it's so important to have it out there. And I think one of the things that's critical is having the great quality data and the way that you present the data in this report. Um, the statistics that you have, are able to put forward really mirror some of the things that we're seeing in the National Crime Agency and our National Assessment Centre. And where we can, we produce assessments on CSA, and where we can, we make them at official levels. So, for example, some of the material that you've got on under-18s, we've done a recent report on that uh, offline and online, and it, it, your, um, your statistics mirror our findings. So it's really useful because we can't do this alone. Having triangulated data is critical, and the better quality data that we've got in this sphere, the more we can lobby for change uh, and more effective mechanisms. So what are we concerned about? We are concerned about sextortion, or sexually coerced extortion. Um, it is uh, an increasing international problem, uh, and it's a very new problem for us, so we are looking at doing more work on that, and obviously working with IWF to, 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 know, you know, to, to find out what you know. Um, we're currently undertaking some more research on that, but we are working closely with uh, international partners to look at operational responses. 
And as you say, education, again, is something that we are looking at our educational products uh, and how we can work with that uh, more effectively. Uh, I was really struck by the um, increase in 7 to 10 year olds uh, in your data, and that was quite, uh, quite worrying. When we went into lockdown, the NCA looked at lockdown and said there's going to be an opportunity here, and we're really concerned about um, growth of CSA material and CSA online. And I don't know whether this particular age group is a response to the, to the lockdown. It'd be really interesting to know what effect that's had on that. But um, it is horrifying to see it coming through further. And we need to look at preventing that. We also have uh, very good educational materials through our CEOP education team. Uh, send me a pic, which is how to talk to people about uh, about what you find online, and then about healthy relationships. So respecting me, you, and us. Those are so the really good materials that we'd like to keep signposting to people. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Okay. Um, Sarah, back to you. Uh, Forty percent of the companies who are our members are UK based, and so we'll be likely be in scope of regulation or have a UK base. What kind of preparations would you be wanting them to make? for the legislation in respect of their responsibilities in this field? What, what sort of, what's the advice you'd give now to our members? Thank you. I think from our experience of the VSP re regime, where we've been already regulating some video sharing platforms, we've got some pretty good lessons. We released an annual report on that back at the end of last year, which talked about our high level insights we'd seen from our experience of engaging with partners. The biggest thing that I think that we picked up from that is generally the lack of preparedness for any sort of regulation. So whether it's an inconsistency in the wrong members of staff coming to meetings that aren't able to answer questions, um, lack of engagement around information requests, not meeting deadlines, not giving us the level of detail that's needed, um, Lack of understanding about things like risk assessments, which are going to be a real core cool part of the online safety legislation. I think I would say the biggest thing that services could do right now is to start to get prepared, get the right resources in, get the right people in the right places, be able to respond. There's a, there's a real value in engaging in a positive, constructive way with Ofcom for this regime. It's the transparency that sits at the center of these information requests and the information that's provided that can really help us see what good stuff is out there, where the gaps are, where we need to have a look at mitigations. We can't get that unless we get the information from those platforms that we're working with. So I'd say that's probably our biggest takeaway. Are there particular challenges for smaller companies? I mean, obviously, the larger companies can invest resources, but a smaller company maybe has very few little engineering resources and so on. Is that a particular, is that an issue you look at? Well, interestingly, that's what I thought. But actually, when we looked across the piece of who we've been regulating at the moment, it's not related to the size of the user base or the size of the platform. It's very inconsistent. So, yeah, I thought that the same at the beginning. And, and we are looking at mitigations and costs and making sure we're being proportionate for smaller services. But I would say that in terms of resourcing and, and really... You know, getting to grips with the spirit of the regime and regulation, it's not actually dependent on the size of the service that we've seen so far. Uh, very large platforms are showing very inconsistent approaches. That's very interesting. Um, Theo, w one of the challenges is I think people don't know how to talk about this stuff. Um, I remember talking to my daughter who's got three little boys, and she was saying, I don't know when to talk to them. I don't know how to talk to them. I don't know what the right moment is. And they're obviously already very keen, even though they're only like three and five, they're aware of devices and they're very, they're, I mean, they're, they're very strictly controlled, but they're very keen to get online and, and do things. So I wondered, do you think, are there lessons you've got or are, are there experiences that you have as TikTok which could help us in a broader sense of educating parents as well as children about some of the dangers and some of the risks that they're running online? Yeah, I think <coughs> it's always difficult um, you can't put everything on the parent, um, and you know we have all of you know all of industry. We have these sort of family pairing tools, and we have things like this, and all across industry, you see really low take up among parents of those tools. And I think if we want our children to be protected, then we need to help the children protect themselves. I think we can do that through the product design, like I said, but I think we can also do that through digital literacy. 
And I think we all have a job in that. I think that can sometimes be very sensitive, the idea that companies are, are going to do that, but I think we have a role to play there. And I think we have to do that with schools as well. Um, I think, um, so I think, I think we have to um, help children protect themselves. I don't want to say that as sort of us saying we're absolving our own company of responsibility in, in the steps we need to take to deter predators. But I think when you look at um, the resourcefulness, the, the way that predators work, I think you know if, if we regard it as once we've got them off TikTok, that's the end of our job, then I, I don't think that's going to provide protection. So I think you know there is a duty on all of us to provide that uh, digital literacy for our children and, and, and sometimes via the children to the parents. And is there more that government or the education service should do in, in, in ensuring that digital literacy, do you think? Well, I think we're, I think the last, the first sort of 10, 15 years of internet regulation was all around privacy. I think what we're seeing now is the second stage where it's around content. And what started really, I think, with uh, something called Nets DG in Germany um, has now grown. You know, I think that kind of demonstrated that the concept could work, and I think now um, uh, uh, with Ofcom's uh, uh, VSP, with um, uh, with uh, Europe's um, Code of Practices, um, uh, and then the DSA, and now the OSB. Sorry to use lots of acronyms, but I'm assuming you all know what these are. But I think what we see is um, a, a trend um, in the idea of content regulation is here and it's going to be the future. And I think, you know, if you went into a technology company uh, 15 years ago, um, there wouldn't have been a big staff working on privacy. Whereas I think if you walk into a technology company today, there is huge teams working on privacy compliance. And I think that's where we will move to within a, a small period of time. And so, I think we're going through that process in compliance with DSA and, and OSB, and I think that's the big trend that you'll see. And I think that will be a, a positive thing for uh, for for, you know, for the services that people use. I just want to pop back to Sarah on that. I, I did once. I was talking to the the then head of Facebook in Germany, an Austrian guy, about the impact of NetGG, and um, because of the level of fines that were exercised on a company that didn't remove alleged hate speech, he said he basically spent all day removing content from Facebook. And a week later, the German Constitutional Court spent all its day reinstating it because they'd over-removed because of the fear of... And I, I just wonder how you get that balance, you know, given that you will have powers to penalise, how do you get that balance right to get the companies to do the right thing without them being risk-averse to important, if controversial, speech? Yeah, absolutely. It's a fine balance and it's something that we're still exploring because we're new to this area of regulation. I think the key to it for me is having effective relationships. So building those relationships with services, having that effective communication, that open dialogue, getting to that position where actually platforms can be very honest and candid with us about what they're seeing on their services, that actually we don't want the regime to be about bashing people over the head with fines. It's about trying to make industry more widely safer and, and the online environment safer. That's, that's the end game of this. And actually, a lot of the impact is going to fall outside of the enforcement action. It's going to be much more widely in those conversations in that you know, encouraging the raising of standards, encouraging innovation, like Tom here, basically trying to really inspire people to want to do better. And that's the bit that I think we're really going to add value. Um, Wendy, I think the there'll be mandatory reporting of content, and the NCA will be the agency that receives that. Is that uh, that strikes me that that could be quite an awesome workload coming your way? And I just wondered what preparations you think need to be made to manage mandatory reporting, and and what how valuable it is to you as the NCA in having that information being fed into you continually. Thanks. I think it's a, it's a challenge that we welcome, uh, and it's a challenge that we are uh, putting a lot of effort uh, and time and thought behind. So building what we're calling the designated reporting body is a major project for the NCA, and it's one of our top priorities. 
obviously, it's still being, the bill hasn't quite passed yet, so we are still waiting for that legislative uh, basis. Um, in terms of, it, when we come on to the reporting, we're talking about that, the importance of reporting. It's an absolutely critical part of that law enforcement response, but also understanding the picture of what we see in terms of what the threat is. Uh, and that enables us to not only do a pursue response, but also to look at how do we better prevent, better educate, and better prepare people to protect against this threat. So it's about that whole round four P response, as we call it. So the designated body is going to be a really important part uh, of the NCA's understanding of the threat, and it will be a critical part of informing Ofcom's response as well. It will be a lot of evidence base for Ofcom. Um, it's it's a not a small project, uh, but we are absolutely welcoming that challenge. Thanks. Tom, um, we've got a growing kind of tech department led by Dan here, which I think we're very proud of and is growing in scope and capacity. How do you think we can work better with industry, with, with the technology side of the industry, just, just technical to technical? How do you see that relationship? We do obviously rely upon support from from companies and their engineers sometimes in building our own technology. But how do you see that relationship developing or the importance of it? Yeah, so that's been a, it's been a fantastic relationship for us over the past year or so. And I think the reason why it's so successful is, is what we've got here. It's no coincidence that we've got law enforcement, regulator, safety tech industry and a platform all sitting together. And what glues us together is our association with the Internet Watch Foundation. So Dan's team, for, for those who don't know, have a very... Um, open door policy for discussing things with companies such as ours and it's I like to think it's driven by a, a, the the fact that everybody wants to create things that can prevent reports like today having to even be published in the first place so I'd encourage anybody to speak to Dan's team I don't want to get them inundated with with things but they um, their focus is preventing children being harmed online they they don't work solely with us. They work with a number of safety tech companies in the UK, Syacom, uh, Crisp, Think, Crisp Thinking, um, probably missed out one or two. And it's all the common goal of trying to prevent rather than just having to react to what some people probably feel is an inevitable problem. But actually, working together, we can prevent quite a lot of it. Thanks. Wendy, the, the partnership with IWF is critical for us because you know, you've, we've got access to the database that you've built up over the years, which has enabled us to vastly expand our, our services to members. And with the support of our members, we've been able to increase the number of analysts to process that database. Do you, see, uh, do you think IDOLF has a long-term relationship with you that that's an important one in dealing with this problem? Uh, are there things we could do that we're not doing, or do you think the relationship is you know, strong as it is now and is sustainable? I think we absolutely welcome IWF's expertise and engagement with that uh, and with Cade. Um, it's really, really important that we have quality data. And when we're talking about this, let's be honest, this is horrific data, but it's, it's really important that we actually properly categorize it um, in order to, A, um, prevent recirculation, um, but to enable companies uh, and, and IWF and others to really understand the threat that they're facing and to be able to identify this in the first place. It's absolutely critical because um, the victim needs to be protected, um, the platform needs to be protected, and the general public needs to know that they've got confidence in this data. So I just want to welcome uh, the work that IWF has put in to looking at the quality of CADE reporting and how uh, we can improve on the quality of categorizing that database. Uh, I think that is a relationship uh, which we need to keep using all expertise that's available um, to improve. Uh, and making sure that we have a sustainable um, mechanism for taking the government into the future, because you know tech evolves constantly, and government has to keep pace with that. So we have to make sure that our data and our databases are really uh, being updated and keeping keeping track with technology. Thanks, and Theo, are you? Com I mean, we think we've got the best quality data set in the world when it deals in when it comes to images. There are other data sets overseas which are not quality assured in the way that ours is. Is it, do you feel it's something that you can rely on on TikTok? Do you feel you need to check our URL list to make sure it's legal or do you feel comfortable just accepting it and <sighs> acting on it? Well, I think, you know, if, when you look at the, I don't think it's a coincidence that the UK is one of the most hostile places in Europe for hosting uh, when it comes to the IWF being here. I think the quality of the work the IWF does 
is uh, the best in the world. Um, and I think if you look at other countries in Europe, it, you know, it still baffles me why other countries can't do as good a job as the UK does. And I, but I think in a large part that's thanks to the IWF being here and the relationship you have with companies here. I think, if I can, I'll just also kind of come back on the question that you asked Sarah about sort of, you know, what happens when you've got um, platforms um, uh, moderating content and you have overkill or, or underkill. You know, I think every algorithm that we train to remove content is never gonna be perfect. So I actually think there is a choice for companies and I think it is a choice. I don't think it's sort of, are just the algorithms working in a vacuum. You know, you, you know, when we train our algorithms, we know whether we're removing too much content or not enough. There is a balance that you have to strike between freedom of expression, um, safety. Um, and I think you know, our choice is we're always gonna be, we'll always go towards more overkill if that helps us to be a safer platform. You know, safety is our priority. Um, but it is a choice for platforms, and uh, other platforms make different choices. Thanks. Um, Sarah, qu last question to you. Future-proofing um, regulation. It's regulation nearly always fa falls behind technology, um, and we have the whole move fast, break things, Californian mentality. And in the last, I guess, three months, the tech world's been convulsed with AI, with large language models, with ChatGPT, BARD, et cetera. It's something that wherever I go and take, that's all people are talking about. And that's the only thing they're interested in. Do you think, uh, I don't want to judge the, the bill before it becomes law, but is it future proofable? And do you think your role is future proofable with the developments of technology that could happen, that could take you to places that frankly a year ago, nowhere, we wouldn't thought we'd be there? I just wonder how you're thinking about that, obviously in relation to this field, but you know, more generally with threats, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is a constant challenge in online CSA, right? That's the one thing we can guarantee is that offenders are going to find new ways of abusing, evading tech to do what they want to do, whether it's on the clear web or the dark web. It's, it is a real challenge for Ofcom. There is a dedicated trust and safety tech team that's been invested in whose sole role is to look at innovation, tech developments, horizon scanning, linking in on things like extended reality, deep fakes, things like that, looking at stuff that's coming over the hill as challenges. And we look at that from a wider policy perspective. Um, I think there is a little gap at the moment, if I'm candid, about what tech is being deployed on platforms and how it's being used. Um, when we have our information gathering powers, when, when we achieve World Recent, that will be a lot easier for us to be able to ask those more, um, you know, detailed questions about AI, about machine learning, about neuro-linguistic programming, about all the things that we need to really take consideration of when we're looking at future iterations of the codes of practice. Um, at the moment, the knowledge picture is quite patchy in terms of what tech is being used and how consistently it's being used, how effectively, going back to Theo's point, you know, are people over-scanning, under-scanning, over-reporting, under-reporting? There's not enough information about that. Um, and absolutely right, we need to strike that balance, freedom of expression, privacy, but also child safety. And there are many other safeguards in the wider system context in reporting bodies where material received is then re-triaged, reassessed before action is taken that provide that wider ecosystem. Wendy, the, um, in terms of the AI developments, large language models, et cetera, which I guess you're also looking at, do you think there's a case for saying that, as some tech companies have called for, to halt development of AI until we properly understand the potential effects and the ethical and policy implications of it? Is that something you would be sympathetic to from the NCA's point of view? I think that might be a bit beyond my area of expertise, to be perfectly honest. Okay. Um, <laughs> It's obviously something we, we do need to look into. Uh, we are also looking at future challenges and future areas. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges we've got is unregulated spaces or uh, com areas which are internationalized and complex, which is, which of course, is you know the internet. It's also the metaverse. These are very difficult places to think about a regulatory regime, which is appropriate and proportionate. And then the complexity of law enforcement responses across countries, some of which may not necessarily want to be engaged in this response. So this is a very complex field. Um, we are very much engaged in that second half of the sphere, which is the law enforcement response. We work very closely with partners across different countries. 
but we are always this part of a bigger conversation, and I think that question you asked me is a very big question. And Theo, from TikTok's point of view, is it something that you guys are having to think about in terms of production service development? In terms of sort of chat GBT and that sort of whole realm of things? Well, I mean, from a personal perspective, I think it's, it's incredibly, uh, it's an incredibly important time. I think this is the biggest change in, in, in our industry since, you know, Google first came along and we moved from a world of sort of looking at indexes to actually searching and finding content. I, w I was at Google for nine years, and I can't believe I'm quite saying this, but you should really download Bing as an app. It has ChatGPT4 built in, and if you use that, you will see it's, it's quite a different experience. So I don't think we yet know what that means. Um, in terms of TikTok, I think um, we're obviously very interested in the potential of this, but I think we're also um, proceeding with caution till we understand um, what the risks are as well as the opportunities. Uh, you know, there is the power of AI to solve a lot of problems, but also, um, you know, AI is only as good as the data set that it's modeled on, and that could lead to um, uh, lots of problems if, if the data set itself, um, you know, if you don't know what that is. So I think we need to proceed with caution, um, but, you know, I'm a tech optimist, so overall I think this is a, a, a good thing, and um, but I certainly would encourage everyone to familiarize, familiarize yourself with what it means in practice. And I think the easiest way at the moment as a consumer to do that is through the Bing app. Sorry, Google. Yeah, very sorry, Google. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Can you show our appreciation to the panel, please, sir? Thank you. We now have the opportunity for some informal networking and drinks and so on. I just want to finish by, first of all, thanking the IWF staff. Um, it's a brilliant staff. It's the most professionally run and driven organization I've ever come across. Um, it's one that every board member is immensely proud to be associated with. And we've got some actually fantastic people working for us who do an amazing job in very, very challenging environments. You know, one of the more distressing, potentially, and upsetting environments you can be in. Uh, and they do it with great calm and assurance and professionalism. So I want to show my appreciation to them. And also, particularly thank TikTok for hosting us. I think we're the first organization to have a meeting here at this uh, really nice venue. So very much thank you. And also thank TikTok. They're not just members and taking our services. They're providing a lot of other support and a lot of other point, joint projects with us. So as do many companies. And I, I, one thing I do want to say is, you know, tech companies get a lot of flack, and some of it's deserved, but I, I think on this field, the partners we work with share a, a really serious commitment to removing and eliminating and driving child sex abuse material off their platforms and off their applications. And that's something I think we can all be very reassured by and very proud of. So thanks very much, everyone. Welcome here. Please uh, hang around. I think there may be donuts left. Theo says take them home if they're not eaten. And uh, we will see you shortly. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.